Happy New Year's, Bill Share. Happy New Year, Matt K. Lewis. Welcome to 2018. Yes. Uh, although the country uh, and the president, I think, finished 2017 much stronger than <laughs> uh, we now apparently begin 2018, so, yeah, I, I feel the opposite about this show. I feel like I felt that we, uh, that that last show of our year was not our best. Well, that, that may be, but I ended 2017 super strong with a giant plate of fried chicken at one of my favorite uh, Western Massachusetts restaurants, Coco. So I highly recommend. Whenever when you're in town, are you, you're going to come to come to town one of these days. I'm going to give you the best fried chicken. I'm going to give you the best fried chicken and the best hamburger. Cause best, um, cause you're the best, talking my language. Best fried chicken is at Coco. Best burger is at the Alvastone. Uh, Coco's in East Hampton, Mass. Alvastone is in uh, Montague, Massachusetts. These are very much off the beaten path places. They've not yet been discovered uh, by the New York Times or anything. But actually, Coco might have been on a little New York Times thing, if I recall correctly. But anyway. It's only a matter of time before Robert Draper comes to town. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Puts you on the map. So uh, I, I was able for a day to put my worries of nuclear annihilation aside and have a giant plate of fried chicken. Yes. So Donald Trump ends 2017. Now, look, I think we can all admit that uh, it's hard to... There were a lot of... Um, like I've been warning about the intangible problems of Donald Trump, the, uh, the, the, the breaking of norms, the tearing up of the social fabric. I've been warning about those things for years. Mm -hmm. But if you put those things aside, and those are big things to put aside, many of us on the center right felt that Donald Trump finished 2017 much stronger than we had anticipated. Um, but now he has started 2018. You know, he, he can't let well enough alone. And uh, there's all these crazy tweets out there as we begin this new year, Bill. Uh, well, if you are of the conservative mindset that I will tolerate the public humiliation, the erosion of America's moral authority, the weakening of the international order, so I can have conservative judges and tax cuts, what's a, what's a few extra tweets? <laughs> what's the big deal? Well, um... Yeah, I guess you could argue that, but I do feel like, um, I mean, look, people like uh, Ramesh Panuru and Rich Lowry uh, at National Review, these are, you know, thoughtful mainstream conservatives, were pretty much where I was at the end of the year, which is to say, look, we've already baked into the cake the fact that Trump is chaotic and unhinged. So that's, we, we've dealt, we've been dealing with that. We've sort of accepted that. But, you know, in terms of actual things like rolling back regulations, things that liberals wouldn't like, but conservatives should, onerous regulations, go appointing uh, solid conservative judges, and including Neil Gorsuch to the Supreme Court, and then getting tax reform better than we probably thought the year was going to go. And let's give some credit where credit's due. We finish out 2017 looking stronger than we might have expected even a couple weeks earlier. And then he starts off the new year reminding us, as he always does, uh, of why he is a very uh, scary president. Um, so so on one hand, you got some policy wins. I think there's, there's a debate going on whether this amounts to uh, proof that uh, Trump is more influential and effective than he's given credit for, or is this really... The bare minimum. I mean, this is a Republican president, a Republican Congress, and this is what you got. I mean, the notion that Trump was sort of extra super special effective seems uh, stretching the case. Any Republican president should have been able to cut taxes and name a judge. <laughs> There's nothing that Trump did that was uh, unique in getting that much. Um, I think Jonathan Bernstein at, at Bloomberg made a made a good case for this is not especially effective. This is. You know, uh, th this is not evidence that Trump is uh, totally shifting the whole country to the right. This is the, what you'd yeah. expect, uh, if, if maybe less than what you'd expect from uh, one party Peter, control of Washington. Well, there's also things that I didn't even mention, like the rolling back of the caliphate and ISIS. Um, well, you, you can't. You, know, give, there you, some... you, you can't give it solely credit to Trump. I know Trump would. But... Well, I know also Trump has made sure that there were no passenger deaths uh, in, in airlines. <laughs> 
this year as well. Um, I, I also made, uh, so I forget who tweeted. Somebody tweeted a whole list of things that Donald Trump could claim credit for. Uh, One of them was ta- Taylor but, Swift's great 2017. <laughs> you know. But the but the air the air safety thing. I mean, it does this make conservatives pause? Here's Trump saying, "I am good at regulating uh, regulating industry." My, I was better on on government regulation of an industry than my predecessors were, even though that's not even true. He wasn't saying they were safer because I deregulated the air industry. He's saying they got stricter. Uh, yeah. So uh, he he's still refusing to uh, at least pose as a fully doctrinaire uh, libertarian conservative. Well, who knows? But I would say that um, as someone who who flew ninety flights in 2017. I'm all, I'm all for regulations that keep airplanes from falling out of the air. <laughs> that's uh, that's fighting words for the libertarians. <laughs> so um, don't they have a natural self incentive to stay in the air themselves? Why do they need the government <laughs> to want them to stay in the air? One would think. One would think. One would hope. Um, anyway, so we you know basically uh, I guess two main points here. One is that there's really a, you know a, the tale of two presidencies. Uh, one is the the kind of spiritual intangible you know social fact social fabric norms that I think Trump has been horrible about but then there's the also the points on the board that have been I think surpri- if you're a conservative the big caveat if you're a conservative surprisingly strong he finishes 2017 getting praise from people such as yours truly and uh, he bumped up uh, what six points in Gallup over the holidays right 34 to 40. But he can't leave well enough alone. He has to start off 2018 by stirring up stuff and getting himself back, you know, as the focus of our attention. And I'm saying I think the advice he should take is don't just do something. Stand there. Right. (laughs) Just this goes to your theory about how a generic Democrat could beat Trump. Right. (laughs) Maybe Trump could be boring for a while. I mean, you know, he can always stir things up later. I mean, I would give Trump credit in that I I think he generally stayed out of the tax reform process. He let McConnell and Ryan do the heavy lifting and, I mean, and didn't really insert himself too much. I think that was very wise on his part. Maybe I don't know if it was by luck or by design, but if I was him, I would take that lesson. But. Uh, there was a New York Times piece by uh, Peter Baker who talked about sort of how Trump has upended all the norms of the presidency. And uh, I thought that was a really good piece, by the way. I know some people criticized it because in the first couple paragraphs, it doesn't make any sort of value judgment. It's just sort of this is what he has done. But I thought that was a very astute piece. Yeah, that's sort of insane to <laughs> expect every article on Trump to, you know, throw him a sharp elbow and every lie. I mean, you you have to trust the reader to draw his or her own conclusions and not, not expect to be, be hit over the head every single time. There was good information in the piece. That's what journalism is, is supposed to do. Uh, and I think it was that piece that noted uh, that Trump can't, even though he literally is the most talked about human on the planet, he literally uh, has, uh, for a clear narcissist, has gotten uh, his narcissism mainlined to his vein at all times. He can't go a day without seeing his name in the headlines, and therefore he p- purposely stirs stuff up just so he can be the uh, the uh, extra special focus of attention yeah. mm-hmm. uh, and so here you are if you're you know taking a step back actually got some legislation passed got your poll numbers up he can't just he can't just sit there he can't leave all of this sounds alone. this almost sounds unbelievable right it's it's like the idea you know nixon wouldn't do watergate because he didn't need it you know <laughs> he it was going to win anyway and it's almost like that's it's hard to believe that someone who's already the president would feel the need to be a provocateur in order to be in the headlines. Mm-hmm. And yet it seems plausible. And it also seems to be like a microcosm of just a larger trend in America today, where a lot of people, certainly political commentators, but I would also say just sort of average Americans um, are going on Twitter and saying you know, controversial things in order to to uh, to get like I just saw this movie. I don't know if you've seen or heard about this. There's so many good movies out. 
Um, who's the uh, the girl from Parks and Recreation? Like she was the intern on that show. I don't know if you saw uh, uh, that. Aub- Aubrey Plaza. She has a movie out where she basically stalks an Instagram an Instagram influencer. You know, mm-hmm. like someone that is like famous, but we would have never heard of them. The movie's called Ingrid Goes West, <laughs> and uh, again, I think it's a pretty good commentary on. Uh, people who the state of America today <laughs> where social media has, has basically made everybody want to be famous and everybody really kind of crave the the instant gratification and attention that comes from from likes and you know now in this case Aubrey Plaza is playing like this kind of um, nobody who becomes like a, a stalker mm-hmm. you would hope that the president wouldn't <laughs> like wouldn't have these same uh, tendencies, but I think he, I fear he might. Well, just to, to circle back to your initial point that this w- was overall good for conservatives because they, they got their policy wins. Uh, Better, so, I would say good, good is, good is within the context of realizing we were already screwed <laughs> and accepting. I, I see, here's the thing I've already gone through a certain amount of acceptance, and I think I'm even ahead of the curve because for me, I was worried about the country and sounding the alarm about Trump back when a lot of liberals were actually rooting for him to be the nominee. So I've had longer to sort of accept, okay, this is where we are. And like now if we can get a great judge or something, that's, that's ice, you know, ice on the kicks the wrong word, right, right, so, but it's something. Right. So, something. I mean, you, you are not going as far as saying this is a net positive for conservatives and therefore we should, we should do this again. <laughs> You're just Except saying in the world as it is. You're you're just saying <laughs> this is still terrible, but uh, there is some there's some silver lining here. Uh, yeah, and better, and, and also just better than I thought a couple weeks earlier. Right. You know, I mean, I, I and I really think that there is this interesting divide where, and, and, and in a way, it's a microcosm of the country. Okay, so the country, in many ways, is doing well. In many ways, in terms of empirical data. You know, not all, but there's a lot of, you know, uh, for example, airplanes haven't, fl- you know, we haven't had these airplane crashes or whatever or, or passenger deaths. OK, can't I'm not giving Trump credit. I'm just saying <laughs> that there are some good things happening in the country, but everybody feels horrible. Mm-hmm. And I think there's like almost a similar weird thing with Trump and specifically with Trump, where there are if you if you're a conservative, the, the big caveat, there are some very nice points on the board. Mm-hmm. And yet. There is this like ethereal, transcendent malaise and angst that I think is more important, actually, mm-hmm. even though it's intangible, mm-hmm. than the deliverables. Right, so, so you're still you're still cl- glass half empty. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. But remember, I'm a columnist, right. and <laughs> and if you write a column that's 750 words. It can't be 300 words of caveats about how bad things really are. You know, mm-hmm. you kind of get rid of that in a sense. And so I wrote, I wrote a couple columns at the end of the year that were like, you know, pretty positive about Trump. And he might have, it's not just me, he might have learned the lesson of like, well, I stayed out of tax reform. Mm-hmm. Things ended pretty good this year. Maybe let's start off the new year by repeating that. So, you know. if, so if you're a conservative, so you have to ask yourself, what do I need to do going forward to keep getting conservative wins? Do I have to accept that the Republican Party is going to be a right-wing populist, nativist, nationalist party, even though that violates some of my uh, traditional conservative sensibilities? I need to accept that bargain with that faction in order to get any conservative policy wins. Um Therefore, I, I'm going to not go never Trump. I'm not going to challenge the the paradigm in the next primary. Uh, or are you going to say, uh, look, this wasn't the absolute worst, but we can't keep doing this. We still need to eradicate this strain uh, of nationalism and populism from the Republican Party if conservative is going to thrive. Uh, and to that, ar- to that latter argument... The downsides, I think, for the Republican Party going forward is you end 2017 not just with the tax bill, but with Senator Jones. 
you've reduced the majority in the Senate from 52-48 to 51-49. So now Democrats need only two net seats to take control of the Senate. Because before, the map is skewed to Republicans. There are a lot more Democratic incumbents up than Republican incumbents. Almost all the Democratic incumbents are, I shouldn't say almost all, but I I think almost half are in red states. And there's only two, there's only one Republican incumbent in a blue state and a second one in a purple state. Uh, that's not even an incumbent now because Jeff Flake is, has stepped aside. So, but now all, and everything else is in a diehard Republican yeah. red state. So, but now Democrats only need to win Nevada and Arizona and hold their own to take control of the Senate. Whereas before it was Nevada, Arizona and getting, you know, getting Texas or getting Wyoming, something ridiculous. Um, now we got the ridiculous state, Alabama. Uh, so, so you have that problem. You have Paul Ryan saying, okay, next step, entitlements. Let's go after welfare. Let's go after Medicare. Mitch McConnell saying, um, we did reconciliation once. You can't do it twice in a fiscal year. Uh, so you need 60 for everything going forward. You ain't doing welfare reform. You ain't doing social security reform. You ain't doing Medicare reform with 60. So you can forget that. Um, so we're, you're, you're pretty limited in, in what you can do going forward. The low-hanging fruit has been picked. Uh, yeah. So it, where does a conservative make the case that this model, this Trump model, is the only plausible model for the uh, survival of conservatism? So this is a this will get. I mean, this is a little bit like um, esoteric or something. But you know, to me, like the fundamental conservative insight is that we don't really know anything, right? And so that's why, like, top-down government planning is a bad idea because uh, it's a fatal conceit to believe that you can sort of know what's going to work and what's not going to work and the invisible hand and all that stuff, right? And so this is where, like, I'm a little weird as a commentator because um, I don't, you know, look, if I if you're a Republican activist or a Republican partisan, it's very clear you want to win winning. Repub- it's about winning Republican seats. I think if you're really a, truly a conservative, you honestly don't know what's best. Right. Or what's what's going to even end up being a more conservative outcome. I, I'm actually maybe maybe um, quixotic, but uh, or, or naive. But but I, I actually have some hopes that Senator uh, Doug Jones is going to be a force for good and, 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 uh, and do bipartisan stuff occasionally when it's appropriate and be a uniter. And if that happens and I, it, it would be betting against, you know, the polarization, but if that happens, I'll be happy. You know, there's that scene at the end of Charlie Wilson's war where Philip Seymour Hoffman is, is telling, uh, uh, Tom Hanks, you know, this like parable or something about I'm trying to remember it, but it's basically like, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a guy gets his, his, his son a bike and everybody in the village says, isn't that great? The kid's got a bike. And, and then the, the Zen master uh, says, uh, we'll see. And then the kid falls off the bike and breaks his arm. And everybody says, isn't that horrible? And the Zen master or whatever says, we'll see, you know, <laughs> and then a war breaks out. And because the kid has a broken arm or a broken leg or whatever, he can't go off to fight the war. And everybody in the village says, isn't this great luck? And the guy says, We'll see. And so, um, yeah, I guess if you're a Republican in the short term, you you exist to win Republican seats and uh, and then you can uh, enact more Republican policy. And theoretically, that's all for the best. But as you know, in politics, sometimes winning is losing and losing is winning. And um, I don't know what's going to actually be the best. And it very well may be. I think it's very well may be the fact that Republicans are much better off that Roy Moore is not a sitting senator in Alabama and that Doug Jones is. So, so, so far, Republicans have not really tried to be bipartisan. Um, I would argue they didn't try to be bipartisan in the Obama era when given the opportunity. I know you put that, <clears throat> put that on not Obama, but I put that more on McConnell. Uh, and they haven't tried very hard to be bipartisan. Now, Joe Manchin gave an interview to Politico a couple weeks ago saying, look, I was I was an easy pickup on tax reform. And these guys didn't even try. Uh, yeah. and, you know, try- I would argue. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. However, I would argue that it has been the case that 
uh, the last few presidents, at least the last two, but probably the last three, had an opportunity to be more uniting and more bipartisan. And they, they've they always gone toward the partisan impulse more. So, and So, so now anyway. you have Doug Jones winning on a message of bipartisanship and civility. Uh, and the other guy's a pedophile. Uh, and, yeah, that too. <laughs> well, allegedly. <laughs> right. Um, and, you know, Manchin is out there trying to say, look, he's still ready to do bipartisan deals. Um, you have in Tennessee... Because Corker's stepping down, um, the former Democratic governor uh, Phil uh, Bredesen, who was a popular two-term governor, uh, moderate governor, he's running on a Doug Jones-style message that we need to work across the aisle, get things done. And Republicans, I would assume, are going to put up a more Tea Party-style candidate. Um, the woman's name who's running right now, her name's escaping me from Tennessee, but she's a she's a hard hard right person. I don't know if she'll get the nominee, but that Tennessee Republican Party is pretty hard right, so I, I would be surprised if they nominate a corker type person. Uh, and now you have in Utah with Orrin Hatch stepping down, uh, the the assumption is Mitt Romney is going to win that on a cakewalk, and you know mm -hmm. some assumptions can be proven wrong sometimes. Uh, but he's got he's got his Utah tie. Some people are mocking him for changing his Twitter bio to Massachusetts to Utah, but I think Utah yeah. and C Romney is one of their own. And um, there was someone else on Twitter. I think I think a Boston Globe reporter. I think it was I think it was Matt Visor. Excuse me if I get that wrong. That pointed out that when Romney first ever governed Massachusetts, he had to disprove that he was a Utah. <laughs> he had to prove his Massachusetts bona fides. Uh, so and Romney, who was was anti-Trump in the campaign and then tried to get in the administration. So Romney's always been someone seen as not really having much of ideological conviction, somewhat of an opportunist. Um, but however you view him, he's certainly not tethered to Trump. If yeah. he is a senator, he is not beholden to anyone but himself, whatever that impulse of his may be. Right. Uh, well, I mean, even Jeff Flake voted with. Donald Trump, ninety some percent of right. the time, and, and, right? maybe, I mean, and maybe Romney's going to be the same kind of guy. That's where Romney would be. Let me let me read you. I got but, an but, email. But, but, from, just just to finish, oh, sorry, just, just finish one point. You you have this potential of a bipartisan civility caucus growing after twenty eighteen, uh, at a time when there are the the bases of both parties don't want that at all. Uh, I mean, I think there's still a, a greater appetite for bipartisanship within the Democratic Party than the Republican Party. I'm I'm all for this, man. I would love to be a part of of this movement. And you know, several years ago, Mitch Daniels got in trouble for talking about a truce on social issues. Mm -hmm. And I think that the reason he got in trouble was most of us interpreted truce to be surrender. Right. But if you think of it in terms of like Let's just agree not to push. Neither side is going to like push this issue, right? We're going to focus on other things and just sort of leave these issues where they are. There's a there's a term for that from Hamas <laughs> called a, oh, is there? called a hudna. <laughs> like a, a hudna is not the same as a truce. It's not. There's no agreement here. <laughs> we have we haven't cut a deal that we're never going to talk about this again. Uh, this was right. this was back, I think, in the Bush days. How do you know this, Bill? Oh, I think I, I wrote about this at the time uh, yeah. because because basically this is when Hamas got elected. Okay. Uh, in the Palestinian authorities, uh, and there was a question: You know, is, have the terrorists just taken over the um, the Palestinian uh, territories, or is there a difference between the international wing and the political wing? And part of the political folks were saying, "Look." Um, we, we, we want to stay in power here. <laughs> if we, if we launch a terrorist attack on Israel now, we're not, we're going to decimate. We're not going to stick around. So let's just agree to disagree for now. Let's say we're, we're just not going to talk about Jerusalem for the time being. And let's focus on other stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh on one hand, I'm super impressed, uh, by this, this deep pool. On the other hand, I'm worried that the, um, that the comparison may actually uh, <laughs> undermine my goals. Um, so, um, no, look, you know, so in any event, I, um, again, 
maybe this is a good analogy. You know, maybe it's foolish. Maybe it's naive to think that your adversaries will uh, act in good faith and um, and 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 beat those swords into plowshares. Uh, but um, but I would love. I, I'm I'm in the mood. I'll just say this. I, I don't know if I'm reflective of of a deeper. Uh, public sentiment, but I am personally in the mood uh, for some cooperation and putting aside, you know, the bitterness and and for civility and that kind of thing. And and if Doug Jones, I know you have floated the idea that Doug Jones should run for president. Well, the the, the first person to float that is uh, Isaac. If you may even pronounce his last name wrong, uh, Ch- Chotiner. Uh, he he wrote that in Slate like twelve hours after he won, uh, and. I threw in a mention of that because yeah. uh, I wrote a piece afterwards that said Doug Jones uh, is evidence that perhaps a generic Democrat would be the best matchup against Trump, which ever since I wrote that two weeks ago, I've just got a nonstop fire hose of angry socialist tweets saying uh, you're what's wrong with the, the Democratic Party. You're you're a pathetic hack. Did you learn the lesson from 2016? You're what's wrong with everything. And what was I, this gerbilism thing? I, I, I'm afraid to Google it. <laughs> yeah, someone called me a gerbilist. Uh, for, I think I know what I think I may know what that means. Yeah, this, but this, I'm this, afraid this, this is a family show, so I don't know if we have to get that. I met. Okay, the okay. is it does Richard Gear enter into Yeah, it? yeah, I, I'm okay. afraid so. Um, <laughs> which, is, um, which is not a true rumor, by the way. Never true. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, what? And just just today, mind you, in the Washington Post, David Weigel has a column about how pundits keep overlooking that Democrats actually have a substantive platform uh, with actual policy ideas and uh, and that there's still this narrative that Democrats want to run as just anti-Trump and not, not stand for anything. And he cites this guy named Nathan Robinson, a writer something called Current Affairs, which is a left wing publication that I think he founded where Robinson takes me to task for the for the generic dem argument uh and a lot and a lot of the criticism I get these folks on the Bernie left keep conflating generic with centrist which I explicitly don't do in the piece like I, this wasn't an argument for rejecting populism and I even say in the piece that you know Jeff Merkley who endorsed Bernie is very much a um, progressive populist, he could run as a generic dem, which is a question of stylistically how he runs. Uh, but everyone wants to ignore that, just put me in the box of neoliberal centrist hack. Uh, so I got I got called out in this Weigel piece, I'm not blaming Weigel for this, saying uh, uh, Robinson was, because Ro- he quoted Robinson saying that there are people out there who want flavorless Democrats who sound like Republicans. And Weigel says he's referring to Bill Scher of Politico and Frank Bray of the Times, neither of whom are actual Democrats. And I would I never argue that Democrats should sound like Republicans. In fact, the, the whole point of generic Dem is the Wait, opposite Weigel, of that. Weigel said that you're that you're not a Democrat. I'm not an elected Democrat. I'm an elected. I, I, okay. I, don't, I don't speak for the party. Gotcha. You know, I'm, I'm a pundit. Um, yeah. I'm an opinion journalist. Uh, so he was pointing out that like it's not, not that Democrats. Official yeah. Democrats are making that kind of case. Official Democrats are rallying behind the Chuck Schumer Better Deal platform, which has all sorts of anti-monopolist policies behind it. Um, but my generic Dem point is being is 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 getting distorted not just on Twitter, but now in the Washington Post as right. arguing Democrats should as Republican light, which is not the argument. No, the part of the reason Doug Jones is an attractive candidate is that he doesn't have a lot of baggage, and he doesn't have a lot of he hasn't had to take a lot of hard votes and all that. If he ran for president today against Donald Trump and he said, this election is not about cultural issues, it's not about social issues, I'm not going to do anything to change the abortion law well, for or against. That's not how he ran. That's not how he ran in Alabama. <laughs> uh, fair point. If. This is a big if. But if he said, it is very clear to me that right now, The biggest problem facing America is is a crisis of confidence, a crisis of consciousness. It's a feeling that we're not all in this together. That is why I'm running for president. That is what I'm going to focus on. I'm going to have a bipartisan cabinet. Uh, We are going to, you know, we are going to do Simpson Bowles. We are going to have, 
I'm I, I pledge that I'm going to have you know my administration is going to be you know half Republican, half Democrat, a team of rivals. Like if he did that, I would I would be like immediately on the bandwagon. Right, but that right but now. What, what you what you uh, illustrate there is an example of running a centrist campaign. And I'm not saying everything you said necessarily is like approved by the center of the country, but it is an attempt to yeah. appeal to a mythical center. That's not Myth- what Doug Jones did. Mythical. Okay, I agree. I will totally concede to you that that is not what Doug Jones did and that you are not calling for that. Right. But my point right. is, and I get, I get that, that our country is polarized and that there are incentives, especially if you want to win a primary, incentives to go to the extremes on both sides. And I also will, again, concede that um, I am not, by, by virtue of me being on this show, I'm not an average American, right? <laughs> and, but, but having said all that, like all of those caveats, I feel like the country needs that right now. Well, now, I, I think, think the closest, the, country the closest, and, and maybe there are other people out there in America. You tell me, sound off uh, commenters. <laughs> Am I the only one hungry for like this kind of leadership right now? I mean, I think there is, I think there is a constituency of people who are not thrilled with the bases of both parties and like the idea of a centrist type candidate. It's just that those people are not unanimous in what they actually believe in themselves. And so the risk of running, you know, the, you know, uh, a Kasich Hickenlooper type ticket kind of thing is at some point you actually run into the actual issues and the unity starts to break down. Now, maybe that can be transcended in some way in this current environment. But when I say mythical center, that, that's what I'm getting at. I don't think there is a centrist constituency that agrees amongst themselves what to do on these various subjects. Well, it is fair to probably point out, Bill, you're, you're more of an historian than I am, but when we've had troubles in America, and maybe you're thinking of Lincoln, uh, of FDR, of Reagan, it, it hasn't been, I mean, especially, I mean, in the 20th century paradigm, you know, the modern, I mean, FDR was a liberal and, and Reagan was a conservative, so... We've gotten past difficult times before um, by not – without reverting or without resorting – without resorting to the sort of centrist thing. And I mean Jimmy Carter I think did try to run on the kind of message that I'm, that I'm urging, right? And, and, and so it, it may be that, um, that I'm a little naive or that just, it, it just doesn't work that way. Does that well, make you know, sense? Well, you know, Carter, I mean, Carter tried to run as a moderate, uh, but the primary message in 76 was, I will not lie to you, uh, and I'll get, and, and we'll have a government as good as its people. You know, he wasn't, uh, I, I don't think he was too policy specific. I mean, they didn't have policies, of course he did, but you know, he didn't really run on the energy crisis. Uh, and then when he left, when he launched into it in his first year, people were kind of whipsawed. Where, where, where is this coming from? Uh, you know, sometimes you can get away with that. FDR didn't run on the New Deal. He ran on balanced budgets <laughs> and then went the opposite direction in 1933 and nobody cared because the stuff was seen as uh, making headway. Uh, so, well, I don't know if there's any historical parallel, good or bad, that would buttress or undermine the argument I'm making uh, as to what I think the country right now could really use. And I do suspect that there would be some political appeal to somebody who could make this argument about civility and bipartisanship if that person could win a primary. Well, even well, even Obama, you know, he came on the stage on we're not as divided as our politics suggest. He, he always presented himself as a healer uh, and Carter was a healer uh, and uh Warren Harding, as I pointed out in uh, my generic Dem piece, you know, he ran in 1920 as on back to normalcy because there was all this social upheaval and econ- economic distress going on in 1919-1920. And he just said, let's, let's, let's put a pause on all this aggressive Wilsonianism. Uh, and he won in one of the biggest landslides in history. So I, I, I think there is a natural tendency as far as we talk about pendulum swings from left to right. There's also pendulum swings from, you know, uh, aggressive action to 
pause. Right. Uh, and uh, I certainly think, even if you don't think generic Dem is quite the way to get there, um, there's going to be an appetite for let's just have 2021 be a time to chill <laughs> after everything that we've been through and get, and get back to something resembling normal. I've been urging this for my entire career. <laughs> I think that, and this goes to like the whole progressive thing in general. I mean, when have we had enough? Right. Like, do we get to the point where agitators and activists say, okay, now we're at the perfect spot. We've, Immigration's at the right level. <laughs> any more would be too much. Any less, not enough. Well, you're never really going to get there. Not enough. So you're always going to have activists based on both sides. I mean, there, there's a reason why the minimum wage is never indexed. Everyone says, "Why don't we index the minimum wage to inflation and just solve this problem?" Because both sides don't actually want it. The Republicans don't want it because they like to see the minimum wage degrade relative to inflation, yeah. and Democrats don't want it because it's a think, it's a fresh issue to to revisit to I generate a, pick- action in the base. Doug Jones's first pledge, first pledge on day one, we index the minimum wage to inflation. Problem solved. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. But you know, you have a lot of folks on the left right now who are gonna, who are clearly gonna resist any attempt to have a back to normalcy type of campaign because they see this as an opportunity. Everyone's mad at Trump's yeah. conservatism. Uh, Trump's election proves that. These, you know, cookie cutter establishment candidates are not political gold. We can elect a revolutionary progressive populace, you know, Bernie or otherwise. So let's take this opportunity to do so. And I and, and I was even arguing in my piece that such a person can't win. Such a person could possibly win. Uh, my argument was that uh, there is evidence that maybe your safest choice for winning is the generic dem and how that person governs is a wholly separate question. You know, some people were right. arguing to me, I this is damning the ability for Democrats to govern properly. FDR governed very differently than he campaigned. Uh, so it's, it's a it's a separate question how one governs. Yeah, uh, but I think Democrats who are looking and liberals who are progressives who are looking to exploit this problem for political gain are part of the problem, right? Shouldn't our focus be bringing people together, healing the country? Uh, uniting as opposed to, oh, Republicans are vulnerable now. They've elected this madman. This is our this is our opportunity to pounce and move the country yeah. even farther left. I mean, I don't want to be too unfair. I mean, if you believe in your heart that these are policies that are good for the country and people will like what's implemented, why would you not try to pursue those policies? I mean, it's certainly sort of, you no know, there's no reason why you can't propose them in a campaign and see if you can generate popular support for them. So I don't begrudge them the opportunity to try to do that. Uh, But I think there is an argument on the left that the only way to win is by a super inspiring, ideologically ambitious candidate and anything else is doomed to fail. And the evidence of 2017 does not support that thesis. The people that won are Ralph Northam and Doug Jones, not <laughs> not Rob Quist, not James Thompson in Kansas. Uh, that's I, I wouldn't overstate the case and say, and say a Rob Quist can never win or a Bernie Sanders can never win. But don't tell me that a Doug Jones or Ralph Northam can't win because I just saw the opposite thing happen. And when Ralph Northam won, you know, everyone likes to make self-serving arguments. So... Uh, Ralph Northern wins. Oh, it's because there was a Democratic Socialist on the ballot for a House delegate position, and the progressive groups came into Virginia, and Ralph Northern rode that wave by himself with their help. Well, what happened in, in Alabama? There's no one else on the ballot in Alabama. Oh, well, that was just because, uh, uh, well, one, it's because there was strong African American turnout, um, but he couldn't have won without whites crossing over or at least showing up as well. Cause there's not, I mean, as, as good as the African American turnout was, he couldn't win on that alone. Uh, there was all, oh, well, he ran against a pedophile. Well, Donald Trump was any number of things. He was accused of all sorts of things. And that clearly wasn't sufficient to elect Hillary Clinton. And so when I point out to some folks, well, why did Doug Jones win? Rob Quist didn't. Oh, Alabama had Montana's an all white state. And Alabama has African American voters. Oh, suddenly Alabama is now a purple state. And, Montana isn't. When Steve Bullock won in Montana, 
with Hillary on the ballot in 2016. I mean, this is another argument that I get. Well, you can't blame Zephyr Teachup for losing in New York or Russ Feingold in Wisconsin because Hillary was on the ballot. She ruined everything. Well, didn't ruin it for Steve Bullock. He managed to win in Montana. Why couldn't Rob Quist in Montana? Bullock was more moderate than Rob Quist. Uh, so th- there's a lot of complicated data points out there that don't easily argue for one strategy or the other. But at minimum... You can't argue that your super special strategy is the only way to win because that is just manifestly not true. Right. I also think that there's um, two different kind of two competing theories. So one theory says that in this modern era, you have to be kind of a celebrity. And if you look at the, the people who've been winning, you know, uh, and Reagan, Clinton, even Bush, certainly Obama, certainly Trump. They've got this larger than life charisma and, and, and appeal. So you could make a linear argument that says, like, in this era, basically, you have to be a celebrity. Um, but I think you could make the other argument that says we always elect the exact opposite of, you know, the last guy. And what would the exact opposite of Trump be if not civil and, uh, you know, Mo- not moderate ideologically, but temperamentally moderate. Temperamentally. Well, I mean, the, I mean, the an argument against a generic Democrat would be we're still in a TV age. Ever since TV, the personal, the the the, the charismatic figure t- t- tends to win. You don't yeah. you're not voting party line, party ticket anymore. You're voting for the person in your living room. Uh, now there are exceptions. You know, Lyndon Johnson wasn't especially charismatic and lovable, but he was up against a more distasteful alternative in Barry Goldwater. Jimmy Carter is kind of a dour of sort, but Gerald Ford was no great shakes. George H. W. Bush was not very charismatic, but they 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 beat the hell out of Michael Dukakis. So uh, there are exceptions to these rules, and perhaps Trump will be discredited enough by 2020 that a ham sandwich would beat him in a primary, so long as the ham sandwich wasn't seen as somehow uh, a pedophile ham sandwich. Uh, so uh, the, it would be hard for a blander. Democrat to survive the primary because people want to get excited about somebody and want to believe that an exciting charismatic person has the best chance. Uh, so I wouldn't put my money on Amy Klobuchar, for example, breaking out of the 15 person Democratic pack. Uh, but it is worth thinking about, OK, I, I know what has worked in past years, but you have to deal with what's going to work this year, what's going to work in 2020 versus a Donald Trump who's generally been between 35 and 40% and has exasperated the majority of the public. I also think, like, I don't know if it's possible to sort of out Donald Trump, Donald Trump, you know? Um, You can't really be more exciting than Donald Trump. (laughs) And he's also going to mock you. And so that is an interesting, I've thought about this question. You know, sometimes, like, um, they'll do, like, well, what if Mike Tyson could have fought Muhammad Ali, you know, or who would win, you know, if they had been in the same era, they're both in their prime at the same time or what, you know, I'm not a boxing aficionado, but they've done this with different, different fighters. Like, um, I wonder like, what if, if 2016's Donald Trump had ran against 2008's Barack Obama? In what year? Well, that's the other variable, (laughs) right? That's the other, uh, unknowable variable. Um, and maybe that answers the question, which is to say that, that you can't say, um, you know, Hillary was clearly a, a, a uniquely bad, bad candidate. Um, and, and we know that Barack Obama is, uh, what, especially in 2008, the, the sort of young up and coming Barack Obama had this amazing charisma. Would that have worked though against a Donald Trump using Twitter and insults? I, 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 I just don't know if anybody could try to play the game of out charismaing Trump, out celebritying Trump, if that would work. Well, I, I don't think Trump is Trump's not charismatic in a uplifting way. True. <laughs> um, you know, his unfavorables have always been bad. <laughs> it's just that Hillary's unfavor and, and and his unfavorables were worse than Hillary's. In 2016, but people who had unfavorable view of both of them sided with Trump for the moment. I mean, that that was the linchpin of 2016. Um, 
And you could argue that's because she was uniquely bad. Or you can argue, as I had, that 2016 was not a year for Democrats, whereas 2008 was. 2008 was on the heels of the Great Recession, and yeah. eight years of was seen as failed Republicanism. 2016 was, I think, an anti-Obama backlash year, uh, where people who... Uh, were railing against political correctness and loss of their way of life and all that kind of thing that tilted the scales to a Republican in the states that determine the electoral college. Uh, that's why I think the year matters so much. And so some of the yeah. criticism I get is, oh, you ran Hillary last time. You want to repeat the same mistake? Well, one, Hillary's not a generic Democrat. She had a very defined personality that was very polarizing to the argument that maybe she had some unique problems. Uh, and Trump was running as an outsider, not an incumbent. So that's, that's a whole different deal. Yeah, totally. Uh, uh, so it's not that a generic Dem is the perfect strategy for Democrats in every election, up and down the ballot in every year. Is that maybe it makes the most sense for beating Trump in 2020? Uh, can't get enough of Bill Sher and Matt Lewis. Our uh, our civility, <laughs> our DMZ ishness. Can't get enough of that this week. <laughs> Good luck. Good news. <laughs> Good news. You, you didn't get your fix last week. We took the week off. This week, you can go to my podcast, Matt Lewis and the News, and listen to more of me and Bill share. We taped it yesterday, and we talked about your Politico magazine column. What was it titled? Um, which 2020 Democrat won 2017. Yeah. So, we so if you want like a an explainer... Everybody's focused on Trump. We're, we're even focused on Trump today. But if you want an explainer, like, while everyone's looking at Trump, what's this invisible primary on the left happening, right, where Kirsten Gillibrand and Kamala Harris and Cory Booker and Bernie Sanders, all of the, what are they doing and who's best positioned in, in this new year? Uh, you listen to that podcast. That's what you do. And read the article. You know, no, you don't need to do that. Click, Just click go the to, link, too. You could do that. But... <laughs> You go to iTunes, you look for Matt Lewis in the news, you get a little more Matt Lewis, and you know, they'll share. You do 80% of the talking in this one. That's right. It's, 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 uh, I, once I get going about my own stuff, you know, I'm, I'm hard to stop. Uh, yes, but it's all good. We love it. We learn a lot. So check that out. Uh, what else, Bill? Uh, I don't know if I have anything else. Uh, I got to think of the next thing. I spent a lot of time on that Democratic piece. Uh, <laughs> and now, like many of you, it's sort of getting reorienting myself to get to, you know I, I had this respite of trump for a couple of days and well, since get back people in the, already the think of of you as this neoliberal hack gerbilist <laughs> and, and 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 some people see me as this rhino cuck conservative <laughs> um maybe we should start this movement to draft doug jones <laughs> and this truce on social issues and championing, uh, indexing uh, the, the minimum wage to inflation. I thought you were you going know. to say we should start a buddy comedy called The, the Gerbilist and the Conservative. <laughs> Do not Google either. <laughs> by the way. I, had a fr I have a friend who, uh, who works in the political consulting f uh, world, and, and he once had a, a, his firm once had a client, uh, a Virginia client named uh, Dick Black. And he made the mistake of Googling that term <laughs> one time. So don't do not do that either. Um, follow us here at DMZ Show on Twitter. Uh, check out Bill. Your podcast is called... Uh, this, is, this is not normal. Liberalaces.com, though. Been a little dormant over the holidays. So we'll see if we can get a new one up soon. And again, check out me and Bill, uh, our latest podcast, Matt Lewis in the News. And uh, stay tuned here in the DMZ. We'll be back next week. All right. Happy See New Year. Happy New Year. Take care.